Uh, hello, thanks for coming today um, and helping me welcome, and I'm really hoping that I get this right, <laughs> Dario Maestropieri to Google to give us a talk on his new book called Games Primates Play, um, an undercover investigation of the um, evolution economics of human behaviour. Um, he's a professor from the University of Chicago of five different things, she said not to mention, but among them are um, comparative human development and um, evolutionary biology. So he's he's an expert in the field. So if you could just join me in giving him a round of applause to say welcome and thanks for coming to Google. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me okay? Uh, great. In 1964, two uh, important events occurred, at least uh, important to me. First, I was born that year. And second, uh, uh, in 1964 is the year in which this book was published, uh, Games, Primates play, uh, Games People Play. Uh, in this book, which uh, went on to become a huge bestseller, sold over five million copies, the author, a psychiatrist uh, uh, named Eric Byrne, uh, uh, argued that uh, when people interact with, uh, with others in their relationships, they do so according to particular patterns, particular rules that, that typically result in uh, uh, in predictable outcomes. And so he had an explanation as to why these uh, rules exist and why we play the games that we play in social relationships. Well, in, in the 50, almost 50 years since this book was published, uh, there's been a, a great deal of progress uh, in, in the science of human relationships. And I think there are disciplines other than psychology and psychiatry that can help us understand why people play the games that they play in, uh, um, in their relationships. There are at least three disciplines that I think can make an important contribution. One is evolutionary biology. And that's because uh, I think that human nature is uh, uh, very much expressed in, in our social behavior. So uh, I think that people have biological predispositions to act in certain way towards others, and that the genetic basis and the, the neural, physiological, cognitive, behavioral mechanisms that control social behavior evolve by natural selection. Uh, and natural selection tends to produce behavior that uh, that have high benefit to cost ratios. Uh, that is, behaviors that are advantageous to the individuals that, uh, that exhibit these behaviors and have relatively low cost. Another discipline that I think it's helpful to understand human relationships is behavioral, economic, uh, behavioral economics. Behavioral economists assume that uh, uh, human behavior is rational, uh, that people behave in ways uh, that increase, uh, again, uh, the benefit to cost ratio, that we behave in ways that increase the benefits to ourselves at a small cost. The difference in the approaches that economists take versus the evolutionary biologists is that the economists assume that uh, rational behavior is the product of conscious choice, that, that we think about uh, the way we want to behave and make these conscious decisions. Uh, whereas biologists don't assume that all behavior is the product of conscious choice, the idea is that natural selection essentially takes care of, uh, of the uh, of rationality aspect of our behavior. So we behave in some, in some, in some occasions unconsciously. Uh, the third discipline that I think can help us is primatology, which is the study of the behavior of other non-human primate species. And we need to know about this because uh, uh, the same evolutionary processes that, that shaped uh, human social behavior in some cases have also shaped the behavior of other uh, primate species, which means that uh, there are primate species in which individuals play the same games in their relationships as we do. So uh, what I do in my book is... Uh, to offer an overview of human social relationships, discuss uh, uh, some of their problems, and some of the solutions to these problems. So I begin uh, by discussing some issues that occur, that uh, arise when we interact with strangers, for example, in, in, in the elevator, or lift, the way you call it here. Uh, then uh, some issues relative to interactions with family members and what happens when we try to help our relatives by behaving nepotistically. Uh, the way we deal with uh, uh, friends and foes, for example, when it comes to issues of dominance and power or cooperation and competition. And finally, how we deal with business and romantic partners. So some of the issues, some of the problems that arise in the cooperative relationships that we establish with particular individuals. For example, I'll talk about the commitment problem and the need uh, in long-term relationships to assess the strength of the bond that we have uh, with our partner and also the issue of uh, how to find an ideal partner to begin with. And then I will conclude by uh, giving you some uh, evolutionary explanations as to why uh, the games that we play in our relationships really were not invented by, by, by human beings, but uh, uh, can also be observed in other uh, animal species. So let me begin by saying a few things about uh, uh, why is it that sometimes we, we interact with strangers in, in a sort of harmless situation, such as uh, 
uh, in the elevator, sometimes uh, we unconsciously perceive that there is some danger there, that there is some uh, uh, risk uh, in that situation. Uh, I had the idea for, for the first chapter of this book and then for the whole book. When I lived in a, a high-rise building in, in Chicago a few years ago, the transportation building, I lived in an apartment on the 22nd floor, so every morning I took the, uh, the lift to go up to my apartment and at the end of the day, I mean to go down and then to go up at the end of the day. And every day, almost inevitably, I met somebody new that I didn't know because there's so many apartments in this building. And as you all know, because you found yourself millions of times in this situation, sometimes whether you're alone with a stranger or with multiple people, you do everything you possibly can to avoid making a direct eye-to-eye -eye contact. Uh, to behave in ways that might be annoying to others, to make loud noises. So you'll uh, stare at the floor or the ceiling, or you will uh, check your watch even though you already know what time it is. Sometimes you'll press a floor button that's already been pressed, but you go ahead and do it anyway. Essentially, you don't want to acknowledge the presence of the other individual. You're a little uncomfortable uh, about this. So why, why is it that uh, uh, this situation occurs? Why is it that, that we have to face these dilemmas in the elevator? between uh, making or not making eye contact, smiling or not smiling, talking or not talking, pressing or not pressing a button has already been pressed, uh, or, and what to do, how not to reveal the, the little tension that sometimes we reveal through our self-directed behavior. We scratch our heads a little bit when we're nervous. So why is it that we're uncomfortable being in a restricted space with a stranger? Uh, this is not a hot topic for research uh, by any stretch of the imagination these days, but uh, in the 1960s it was. And uh, an anthropologist, uh, uh, named Edward T. Hall, I wrote a book called The Hidden Dimension, in which he uh, argued that, uh, that people have a personal space uh, that uh, is analogous to an invisible bubble uh, that we carry around ourselves everywhere we go, and that uh, we respond to, to an invasion of this personal space. So when somebody gets too close to us, then we get defensive. And he drew an analogy between people's personal space and animals' territories. So the idea is that when an animal who has a territory uh, the territory is invaded by a stranger, the animal would respond aggressively or trying to defend the territory. And so that was the explanation, which I never really found very convincing. First of all, because I don't think it's a real explanation, right? It doesn't explain why there's this bubble and why is it that we don't like uh, having this bubble uh, invaded by someone else. It's simply a description of what happens, but without really explaining why this happens. So uh, I have a different explanation, and uh, it's illustrated here by, by these two slides. Uh, I don't know if some of you remember this old movie from the 80s, uh, directed by Brian De Palma, called Dress to Kill. But in one of the uh, most famous scenes of the movie, uh, a character played by uh, act uh, actress Angie Dickinson is in the elevator going up to the seventh floor, and the elevator uh, door opens, and the killer, who's uh, uh, dressed uh, like a woman wearing a wig and, and sunglasses, uh, slashes uh, 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 the woman's face with a razor blade. <laughs> and so uh, there are a lot of scenes in, in horror movies in which people are, are murdered in elevators. I think it's the second most common place for murders to occur after the shower, if you think about it. Uh, so that's another cartoon that sort of illustrates maybe some of the unconscious fears that we might have if, uh, if we ride in elevators with strangers. <laughs> so I think that the real reason why we act the way we do is not, that, uh, is not that we're concerned about our bubble being invaded, but that our mind unconsciously registered that there is a risk of aggression, being so close to a stranger in a situation where uh, there not, there's no opportunity to escape if, if there is a fight. So for example, we don't make eye-to-eye -eye contact because in all primate species, uh, direct eye-to-eye -eye contact is perceived as a threat. So we unconsciously know this, that if we stare somebody in their eyes, they might not like that, and they might think that we want to pick a fight with them, and so we avoid that. Uh, so uh, if we put two monkeys in a cage uh, who have not met before, you see exactly the same dynamics. You see the same elevator behaviors. Uh, you see the same uh, efforts to try and uh, uh, act uh, indifferent. Uh, then there's things that are unique to, to humans. So one thing that I've noticed on my many elevator rides in Chicago is that the sometimes uh, I already press a uh, floor button, and then a stranger walks in the elevator and presses this button again. Why? Is it that uh, the person did not see that the button was already lit? That was not the case, because I noticed that they actually look at the, uh, the panel, they realize uh, the button is already lit, but they press it again. Why? <laughs> again, I think this has to do with uh, uh, trying to uh, not to acknowledge the presence of the other person. Okay, So if you see the button has already been pressed, you acknowledge there's somebody there, uh, has pressed the button, happens to be going to the same floor as I am. So there's something that, 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 linked up, that, that links us. Uh, uh, we even share goals. Uh, you know, this uh, 
uh, animal researchers like to think that uh, sharing of goals is a very important aspect of, uh, of our lives and behavior, something that might be unique to, to humans. So it, it might be the hallmark of personhood. And so it's just, it's just easier if you have to deal with a potentially dangerous stranger not to acknowledge that, that this person is there, that is a real person, has goals, and that you uh, connect in some way. So it's just easier just to ignore and just press the button again. <laughs> and sometimes this happens. So I mentioned that you can put two monkeys in a cage and observe some of the same behavior. And that's what I did when I was a college student many years ago at the University of Rome in Italy. My very first experiment, uh, I worked with uh, uh, non-human primates was to uh, uh, put two monkeys in a cage. I had many different combinations of uh, uh, individuals, uh, some of which uh, had met before. Uh, they were housed in the same group. Uh, and others instead who had not met before. So I, I let them uh, be together in this cage for an hour. I recorded their behavior and, uh, and I observed what happened. So in, in the pairs of monkeys that had met before, that knew each other, what happened was that these monkeys very quickly started grooming each other. Uh, so they spent almost the entire hour grooming each other, which is an affiliation, affiliative behavior, reduces tension. So essentially the monkeys uh, try to, to deal with the awkwardness of the situation by engaging in this behavior. The pairs of monkeys in which uh, uh, there was uh, no previous uh, familiarity, uh, initially they showed a lot of elevator behaviors, a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, avoiding eye contact. And then two different subgroups of pairs emerged. There was one subgroup of pairs in which uh, uh, each monkey of the pair requested to be groomed uh, by the other monkey, and monkeys do this by showing the part of the body that they want to have groomed, for example, an arm or the back of their body. Uh, but typically, the other monkey would not uh, uh, start grooming. Instead, would respond to those requests with another request. So he said, no, I'm not grooming you. You groom me. And, uh, and they kept on uh, sort of uh, rejecting these advances from the other. And so uh, there was very little grooming going on the whole hour because they kept on asking each other to groom and kept on saying, no, you do it. It's your turn. Uh, whereas uh, in other pairs, uh, uh, grooming started very late in the session. And eventually, when it started, essentially one of the two monkeys did all the work. This monkey seemed very concerned about the situation and essentially accepted to do most of the work. So initially, I couldn't make any sense of these, uh, of these differences in behavior. And then finally, I realized that the monkeys were playing a game, which is in, uh, in economics and in game theory is called the prisoner's dilemma, which is a way in which uh, cooperative interactions may or may not occur when uh, two individuals are put together in a situation like this. And I'm sure you're all familiar with, the, with, the, with this model, but for those of you who are not, uh, so it's a hypothetical situation in which uh, two men are accused of the same crime and they are interrogated by the police uh, independently in separate, separate rooms where they cannot uh, uh, communicate. And each person has uh, two options. They can either confess, uh, they can say, I did it, I committed the crime. This is called the cooperate uh, move. Or they can accuse the other, uh, which is called the defect. And uh, uh, the payoffs in this game are uh, the convictions that they get, depending on, on what they do. So the number of years of prison sentence that they get. So if, uh, uh, if they both defect, uh, they both get three years. Uh, if they both cooperate, they both uh, uh, get one year in jail. But what's interesting uh, is what happens if one uh, person cooperates and the other defects. So the person who defects actually walks away with, uh, with no uh, sentence at all whereas the one who cooperates uh, gets a very uh, heavy sentence, five years in jail. So as you can see from this matrix, uh, uh, if you take the perspective of player one, you see that it's always uh, uh, advantageous to defect, not knowing what the other person will do, because uh, if you defect and the other uh, cooperates, you get zero years versus one year, so it's better to defect. And if you defect and the other defects, you get three years versus five. So not knowing what the other will do, if you have certainty that the other will cooperate, you might choose to cooperate. But not knowing, it always pays to, uh, to the fact. Uh, this, uh, this is what uh, you do if you interact with uh, a stranger only once. But if interactions with the same individuals are repeated, then the best strategy is called tit for tat, which is that you simply uh, do what the other person has done in the previous move. So if the, the other partner has cooperated in the previous move, you cooperate. If they defected, you defect. And sort of keep track of uh, uh, previous moves. So. Uh, these are some of the problems that arise in interaction with strangers. The main problem is that uh, uh, you don't know what the stranger's intentions are. You don't know whether they're friendly or hostile. Uh, uh, the situation gets uh, more complicated if this encounter with the stranger occurs in a restricted space and uh, where the cost of aggression will be high. If two monkeys get into a fight in a small cage, there's a good chance they'll, they'll get seriously injured. The solution to this problem is to develop these uh, protective behavioral strategies. Uh, so uh, when cooperation is possible, 
uh, uh, the solution to the problem depends on whether you're interacting uh, with uh, the other individual only once, in which case uh, you tend to behave selfishly. Uh, if you interact repeatedly, um, uh, instead, uh, tit for tat is, is the way to go. Now, these sorts of problems uh, do not occur uh, when you interact with people you know very well, and especially with family members, because you have a, a shared interest with these people. So there's all kinds of different problems that that uh, uh, arise with uh, family members, and one general problem with relatives is that you have to help them, right? Especially if you have children, you want your children to, uh, to be successful in life, and so sometimes you end up uh, uh, behaving nepotistically. Uh, what is nepotism? Uh, nepotism is widespread in nature. Uh, biologists are very familiar with it. And to a biologist, nepotism simply means uh, uh, to favor your relative members at the expense of non-relatives, okay? There is no animal species on this planet where individuals favor non-relatives at the expense of family members, okay? So nepo nepotism is a human uh, phenomenon. This is a cartoon that sort of illustrates the issues or somebody's looking for a job and the guy says, you've got a great CV, but you're not quite what we look for because they look for uh, the sons of, of the owner. And so there's a photo with all the same face. That's what they're looking for. So um, in, in uh, preparing for, for writing to this book, I came across uh, an interesting book written by Adam Bellow, who happens to be the son of uh, a former University of Chicago English professor, uh, Saul Bellow, who is also a Nobel Prize winner for literature. So his son, Adam, uh, wrote a book uh, called In Praise of Nepotism, in which he made some interesting claims, which I try to summarize in the slide just to give you a gist of, uh, of what, what, what he says about nepotism. So let me read it very quickly to you. He says, uh, nepotism is something we can hardly do without. For one thing, nepotistic concern for the welfare of children is the engine of the capitalist system. Take that away, and you destroy the main incentives for innovation and the creation of wealth. For another, meritocracy and living by personal ties is inhumane. Finally, on the individual level, nepotism is a profoundly moral relationship, one that transmits social and cultural values and forms a healthy bond between the generations. In short, nepotism works, it feels good, it is generally the right thing to do. It has the, its origins in nature, has played a vital role in human social life, and boasts a record of impressive contributions to the progress of civilization. So that's an interesting position to take. Uh, obviously, I agree with some of the statements here. I agree that uh, uh, nepotism has its origins in nature, as I explained. But there is a big difference uh, between uh, nepotism in animals and nepotism in humans. So I wrote an article that was published in a magazine uh, in which I uh, uh, elaborate on this argument. And one of my chapters in the book is about this. But just to, uh, to make a long story short, the difference between uh, uh, um, nepotism in animals and in humans is that uh, uh, when uh, animals behave nepotistically to help their family members, they don't break any rules because there are no rules in animal societies. There's no uh, moral rules. There's no societal rules, cultural norms. There's no laws. Uh, there's no right or wrong. There is no morality. Animals uh, uh, are amoral. Whereas uh, in humans, the problem with nepotism is not that we uh, help our relatives, but it's how we help them. And uh, almost inevitably, when we help uh, uh, relatives, we end up breaking some rules, okay? So we end up breaking some moral code, we end up breaking some uh, laws, uh, some cultural norms, and in some cases, we end up uh, committing crimes. So there are people, uh, uh, dictators, for example, who murder others in the process of helping their family members. So, so I, I sort of uh, provide a very alternative uh, uh, view of uh, uh, the benefits and, and the problems with nepotism uh, in human societies versus uh, in animals. Well, let me switch gears a little bit right now and talk about uh, uh, how we deal with uh, friends and foes with regard to issues of uh, dominance and power, something that everybody has some interest in, in I believe. So uh, again, when I was writing this book, uh, uh, one day I, I happened to think about the fact that uh, uh, human beings have evolved uh, uh, essentially to interact face to face with others. Okay? For much of our evolutionary history, we had relationships with people that we could see directly, that we could hear, and that we could touch. Right? Uh, but these days, instead, we maintain social relationships over email or, uh, or over Facebook or, or Google Plus or whatever. So, so we maintain relationships with people that we can't see. So I wonder if this way of maintaining relationships has altered in some fundamental way uh, the way we, we have our relationships. And then I started thinking about uh, some the dynamics, for example, 
uh, in which emails are exchanged between people, I realized that no, even though we use email, there's still some dynamics uh, in these email exchanges that remind us of, uh, of the way we used to deal with relationships and also the way other primates uh, deal with it. For example, if you think about it, the way two people exchange email messages with one another, the way it happens is that typically th there is an email conversation with the messages going back and forth, which begins when one person sends an email uh, to another one, typically asking some questions or sharing some information, or making some requests. Uh, the receiver of the email thinks about it, then replies after a while. Uh, answering the questions, and the first person writes another email. There's some interval of time between the email and the response, so the exchange goes back and forth for a while, and then at some point, somebody doesn't reply anymore, and that ends the conversation, right? And then maybe there'll be another conversation about a few days later or months or whatever, right? Well, if you think about it, who starts the conversation exchange? How long it takes to reply? How long or short? the replies are, and who ends the conversation about, in my view, these are not random phenomena. There is a, there is a logic to it. <laughs> and I think the logic has to do with differences in status between the two individuals, okay? In every relationship, there is an individual who's dominant, an individual who's subordinate, one of higher status and one in lower status. And what this means is that there are different benefits and costs, okay? So the person of lower status has more to gain from the interaction, and so is more willing to invest, the other one has uh, uh, less interest in investing. To illustrate this point, let me give you uh, an example, a hypothetical email exchange between, say, a graduate student named Jessica and her advisor, Professor Smith. Okay, they're having an email exchange, which begins when uh, Jessica uh, writes a long, unsolicited email to Professor Smith, in which she asks a lot of questions and requests some information. Okay, Professor Smith sees the email, he lets it sit for a while, uh, and then sends a short reply, answering all the questions, providing all the information that Jessica requested. Obviously, Jessica's very encouraged by the fact that she got the reply from her boss, and so immediately she sends an even longer email with more questions, more requests for information. Uh, this time, uh, 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 Professor Smith waits a little bit longer, he waits until the next day, okay, and then uh, responds with an email that is a little bit shorter than the first one. Uh, but Jessica then writes back, and writes uh, two or three more emails, Professor Smith uh, uh, replies uh, uh, later and later and with increasingly short uh, uh, messages until after email number five from Jessica, uh, Professor Smith lets this email set indefinitely in its mailbox and that's the end of the conversation. Okay, if I describe the way two chimpanzees groom each other, you'll see that there's some interesting similarities in the dynamic. So the way grooming is exchanged between ch two chimpanzees is that the subordinate individual approaches the dominant and starts grooming, does so for a very long time, then stops and asks for the dominant to groom back. The, the dominant thinks about it for a while, then grooms the subordinate, but for a very short bout, and then stops and says, now your turn again. And so the subordinate grooms for a very long time again, then stops and asks the dominant to reply. The dominant this time waits even longer, and his reply is even shorter, and the grooming goes back and forth until the dominant simply gets up and walks away, and that's the end of the email exchange. <laughs> okay, so there's an interesting similarity. So nothing has changed completely because, because of email uh, uh, as, as a medium for communication. But let me tell you more about what dominance is, okay, and why we should care about it. So I'll use a, a simple example to illustrate uh, uh, a game theory approach to dominance. Uh, let's imagine that uh, one day, Yogi Bear and Boo and Boo Bear uh, meet in the middle of a forest and find an apple. They're both hungry, they both want the apple. The apple cannot be shared. Uh, and so each bear has two options. They can either threaten the other to escalate a fight to get the apple. That's called the hawk move. Or they can let the other bear uh, get the apple. That's called the dog. Essentially, you uh, behave submissively. Okay, uh, in this case, just to keep things simple, uh, let's assume that uh, if they have a fight, each has a 50% chance of winning the fight. In, in, in reality, uh, the contests are never symmetrical like this. But in this situation, there are three possible outcomes, three possible situations. One in which both bears play hawk, so there's a fight over the apple. One in which they both play dove, so there's negotiation over who gets the apple. And the third situation is one in which one plays hawk and the other one plays dove. That's dominance. Okay, so dominance is a situation in which uh, a disagreement or a conflict of interest resolved by one individual acting aggressively, threatening to escalate a fight, and the other one say, okay, you can do it, you can have it your way, okay? Why does dominance occur? Why does dominance exist? Because uh, it would be uh, very expensive in terms of uh, 
energy and time and counterproductive in many ways to resolve all disagreements through fighting or negotiation. Imagine how many times those of you who are married, you disagree with your spouse over what food you're going to eat at dinner or what TV channel you're going to watch every evening. If you had to fight over every disagreement or if you have to negotiate over who decides this and that, I think that this will be a huge strain on your relationship uh, with a lot of negative consequences. And that's why dominance exists. If there's one person who calls the shot all the time, essentially this makes things easier, uh, uh, quicker, and saves everybody a lot of uh, stress. Um, so uh, dominance is, is a uh, ubiquitous phenomenon, uh, a universal aspect, I, I, I think, of all human relationships. There's dominance between parents and children. There's dominance between uh, siblings. Uh, children fight to establish dominance with their peers uh, as early as two years of age. There are studies of kids on playgrounds uh, where they establish dominance with each other. I think there's dominance in romantic relationship. But you can ask yourself whether you or your partner is more dominant in your relationship, who makes the decisions. And obviously, there is dominance in the workplace. There's dominance between employers and employees. And I want to talk a little bit more about this type of dominance. So imagine a company such as this one. Every individual, every employee has a dominance relationship with every other employee, right? The result of this is a dominance hierarchy that uh, looks a little bit like this. So there is somebody at the top and uh, other people <laughs> of various levels, various steps of the ladder. Uh, so suppose that uh, uh, you're a, a, a new employee. You just joined this company. Typically, you find yourself uh, sort of towards the bottom, but you're ambitious. You want to climb the ladder. So how do you do it? Uh, how do you climb the ladder in the workplace? Um, it turns out that uh, there's different ways to do it, uh, different strategies. So um, uh, I talk about these three strategies, and I illustrate them with uh, a hypothetical character. Okay? So the first strategy is illustrated by a person I call the good citizen. Okay? So this is a new employee who joins the company and is very friendly, very submissive, says yes to uh, all requests for work, attends all the business meetings, never complains about anything. Uh, never rocks the boat, uh, never asks for a salary raise or a promotion. Essentially, the strategy is, is, is to be a good citizen and to wait passively for things just to take their course and uh, to hope that uh, you will slowly and gradually increase in rank through a seniority system where eventually you are rewarded for your good behavior by your bosses. Okay? Some people use the strategy and it, it may work, but if you happen to be the ambitious type who wants to climb quickly and maybe get to the top sometime soon, I would not recommend the strategy. At some point you need to rock the boat if you want to <laughs> uh, get up there. Okay, so then there's the second strategy. Uh, illustrated by this individual I call the Young Turk. Okay, so this is a guy or a woman who instead has no patience, has no interest in playing the good citizen. Uh, he wants to get up uh, and get there fast. And so he will challenge the person at the top almost on day one. So imagine that you're a new employee at Google. Uh, the first day you join the company you're in a business meeting, you say, I have issues with the CEO of this company. I have uh, proof that he's I don't know, embezzled money, whatever, and I can be a better boss and, you know, see how that goes, whether uh, uh, this strategy works. Essentially, it's a coup d'etat. It may or might not work, depending on the circumstances. People who attempt this typically are very self-confident, very cocky. They uh, obviously think they have reasons why this might succeed, and it might under certain circumstances. Then there's a third strategy illustrated by uh, a character I call the Machiavellian strategist. So this new employee is somebody who initially acts very nice to everybody, very friendly, uh, will uh, uh, establish relationships with every other employee in the company, will take everybody out to lunch the first month, uh, but in the meantime will gather information about the dynamic of power within the company. Uh, so this person finds out uh, who has power and who does it, who's going up and who's going down on the hierarchy, who uh, is friends with whom, who's enemies with whom, who's sleeping with whom, essentially identifies a few key, key players and establishes alliances with these key players. And then after a while, when the good opportunity presents itself, using this uh, 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 base of support that this person has built, eventually this person will challenge the person at the top and try to uh, uh, take their place. So the interesting thing about these strategies is that if you uh, study uh, a particular kind of monkeys called macaque monkeys, which I, which I study. These are Asian monkeys that live in large groups. They have dominance hierarchies, just like uh, our own. Uh, if you study males uh, in the process uh, uh, of uh, migrating to a new group, so males leave the group in which they're born and join a new group when they reach puberty at about four to five years of age. 
So they join this new group where they don't know anybody. There's a well-established uh, dominance ladder. And obviously, these males would like to get to the top and be the alpha male because there's all kinds of benefits associated with that. Well, they can do one of three things. We happen to be equivalent to what you could do in a, uh, in a company. So you can act as a good citizen, what we call the unobtrusive immigrant, behave submissively, start at the bottom of the hierarchy, and hope that uh, gradually and slowly will, you will increase in rank, essentially through a seniority system, because the older, more senior, more dominant people eventually will die or get sick or leave the company, and you will uh, essentially be rewarded for your patience and your uh, good behavior. Then there is the challenge immigrant, the guy who uh, joins the group and on day one picks a fight with the alpha male, challenges the alpha male. They have a big fight. This is a young male, typically, a very self-confident, strong, high testosterone, risk taker. In some cases, this uh, is successful. So he will defeat the alpha male uh, in a fight and will become alpha in one day. Uh, and then there's the challenger resident, somebody who's a little more Machiavellian, will join the group, uh, behave submissively initially, uh, establish relationships, uh, gather information, make alliances, and then one day, maybe a year later, launch the challenge. Okay, So things are very similar. So the question is, why is it that we see these three different strategies? Why do they exist? And what's the best strategy for you uh, in, uh, in uh, whatever situation you find yourself to be? So there's theories in biology, which also use some principle from economics, that essentially tell you these strategies exist and uh, there's pros and cons depending on the structure of power within the organization. Okay, so in the figures there, there is a, that's the power ladder. And it makes a difference how this ladder is positioned, whether it's positioned sort of in a, uh, against the wall, sort of in a gentle slope like that, almost horizontal, or whether it's almost vertical like that, it's on a very steep slope. In the first case, essentially, you find yourself in a large organization uh, uh, where the system of power is pretty egalitarian, power is distributed among uh, different people, not just in the hands of one person at the top, and there's a high degree of social inertia. So in this situation, the benefits of being right at the top are relatively low because, as I said, power is distributed. It's not all in the hands of one person. And the cost of attaining top rank through a direct challenge, for example, of your CEO, are potentially high because the CEO has a lot of support. There's a lot of inertia. So, so the chance that you might succeed in that uh, are very low. So I recommend the good citizen, or if you're a monkey, the unobtrusive immigrant strategy. <laughs> but if you find yourself in a different situation in which uh, uh, there is a steeper slope ladder. The system is more despotic. The power is concentrated in the hand of one person or a couple of people. Then the benefits of top rank are very high, okay? Because it makes a big difference being at the top. So there's high stakes, okay, in challenging the leader. Uh, the cost of a direct challenge might vary. For example, in a small group uh, where the leader does not have a strong base of support, uh, it pays to, to try an immediate challenge because you have higher chances of, of succeeding. So you might want to try the Young Turk or, or the challenging immigrant strategy, whereas in a larger group, uh, the cost is higher. So in both cases, the benefits are very high because there's a lot of stake. But in the second case, the costs are higher, and so it pays to wait a while to gather information, to build alliances, and then the challenge. So you want to be a Machiavellian strategist in this situation. So, so these are some of the things that we can learn from evolutionary biology, from economics, and, uh, and from studying other primate species. Uh, there's more we can learn about um, uh, relationships with friends and foes when it comes to issues of cooperation and competition. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, I brought a, a slide uh, of my research institute at the University of Chicago. It's called the Biopsychological Science Building. And that's a colleague of mine, Dr. Steve Chevel. He's a psychologist. Uh, he loves espresso, as uh, I'm sure many of you do. So he bought, uh, years ago, a very fancy espresso machine and runs an espresso club, which means that people go there in the morning and make, uh, make their own coffee, and then they, they mark uh, a paper sheet on the wall, recording essentially how many cups of coffee they, they've had that day. At the end of the month, that uh, you count, uh, and people pay their bills. Okay, So nobody checks, nobody monitors. Uh, somebody in the UK at the University of uh, uh, Newcastle had a similar system where people would make themselves coffee and tea and then put coins in a box to pay for their coffee and tea. So this uh, psychologist did an experiment where uh, on a certain week he would put or she uh, put an image of flowers uh, on the file cabinet right above the coffee maker and on the following week there'll be an image of two eyes and then these images alternated so one week there were flowers one week there were eyes and then they checked and recorded how many coins people put in the box. As you can see from that graph, every week there were eyes there. People paid a lot more for their coffee and for their tea. So well, why is that? Is that the people think that somebody's watching, that somebody hidden in the, in the cupboard there, monitoring what they do? No, obviously not. But unconsciously, every time we see eyes, 
we, we think that, that there is some perception that we're being watched. And when people perceive that they're being watched, there's a lot of studies that show that they tend to be more honest, more cooperative, more generous. Okay, so there's studies showing, for example, that if you take a, a computerized test with another person in which you can choose whether or not to cooperate, and the image on the desktop, the background image has a pair of eyes like this, and they don't even need to look that human, so people tend to cooperate more, tend to be more generous, and to be nicer if there's a desktop image like this. And there's even a study that showed a robot, uh, this is a robot built at MIT called Kismet, that does not look like a human being at all, but has a... Uh, 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 big, uh, big eyes, and uh, so when people see the picture of the uh, robot, they say, oh, somebody's watching me. And so, for example, um, studies have shown that people are more likely to cooperate in a prisoner's dilemma game or to contribute to the pool in public uh, goods game. These are experiments that economists uh, uh, use. If their identity is revealed, then that if they play anonymously. And also it's well known that people are more likely to donate money to charities if uh, uh, their identity is revealed and if uh, the amount of their contribution is acknowledged. So why, why this happens is that uh, uh, if you're being watched, or if you think you're being watched unconsciously, uh, there is a potential gain from, uh, from, uh, from behaving yourself, okay? So uh, you establish a good reputation, which uh, uh, can mean uh, good business in the future, okay? So people take notice of who acts in a cooperative play and who doesn't, and uh, if you don't behave yourself while you're being watched, you might gain a bad reputation, and people sometimes go uh, a great length and they're willing to invest a significant amount of money to give somebody a bad reputation. In this case, this was a, an angry woman whose husband probably cheated on her and she obviously spent a lot of money to put this billboard out there, uh, essentially giving her husband a bad reputation and trying to prevent him from finding uh, mates in the future. So, uh, so when you're in the spotlight, uh, it pays to cooperate, okay? So if you're being watched, uh, the reputation benefits of corporation are high, the costs of cheating are high too. Uh, but uh, uh, what if uh, you know for a fact that you're not being watched, that nobody's watching? What if you're operating in conditions of anonymity or in the darkness? In that case, uh, uh, the benefits of being competitive might be high and the costs are low because you think or you know that you're not going to get caught. So to illustrate that, uh, I discuss in my book uh, uh, the New York City power blackout of 1977. So one day that year, uh, a large part of the uh, city was in the darkness, was left in the darkness for several hours uh, due to a lightning uh, strike. And, and that night, uh, hundreds of people were mugged, raped, or murdered. Uh, over 1,500 stores were looted. Uh, more than 500 police officers were injured. More than 4,000 people uh, were arrested, and many more probably committed crimes that were not arrested, were not caught. And most of these people had no previous criminal record, so it's not like all the career criminals committed crimes and no one else did. But this was the large mass arrest in, in, arrest in the history of New York City. There's a proverb in Italy that goes uh, something like this, l'occasione fa l'uomo ladro, which means opportunity turns men into a thief. Uh, what does that mean? Well, what's a good opportunity for stealing? It's one in which the benefits are high and the costs are low. Okay? If you know or think you're not going to get caught, that's a good opportunity to be a thief. And so if you believe in this proverb, uh, uh, you, you can think that essentially there are two different uh, ideas, two different views as to why there's police officers out there patrolling the streets, okay? Uh, some people think that the world is divided into good people who never do anything wrong and bad people. And uh, the police officers are out there essentially protecting the good people from the bad people. But uh, there's another uh, view, uh, which is that uh, the police officers are out there not to protect the good people from the bad apples, but essentially to discourage everyone from committing crimes and to, and to make sure that they're punished if they do so. So the, the bottom line is that people are sensitive in these changes in benefit to cost ratios. And whenever the benefits of behaving selfishly are high and the costs are low because you don't get caught, then people have the tendency to behave in a more competitive, more selfish way. There's another example I use in my book of uh, how anonymity uh, may uh, promote uh, uh, competitive impulses. And that is uh, uh, the way uh, the peer review process works in academia, the fact that professors and researchers review each other's papers and grant applications, and in most cases they do this anonymously. So when you review uh, somebody's paper, you know the author of the paper, but uh, you don't know, they don't know uh, your identity. 
Okay, so peer review is anonymous in general to protect reviewers from the wrath of rejected authors. So the idea is that if you know the identity of the person who rejected your grant application or your paper, you're going to try and retaliate. Okay, that this occurs, there is uh, uh, evidence of that. This is uh, a well-known uh, uh, episode in February 2010, a biology professor in Alabama who was denied tenure in her department by her colleagues shot to death three of them at a faculty meeting. She went there with a rifle and, and killed them all. So you can be angry if, if you get rejected. <laughs> so, but the question is, in this system, who protects authors from the anonymous reviewers? Okay? So the anonymous reviewers are in a position in which uh, they can be competitive with authors and get away with it because their identity is unknown. Does this really happen, or is this just the product of my uh, paranoid imagination? It does happen. <laughs> there are studies of the anonymous peer review system that shows that manuscripts are more likely to be accepted when authors request that competing researchers be excluded uh, as reviewers. Okay, so if you know who the potential bad guys are and you tell them, I don't want these people to review my stuff, it's a better chance that your, your paper will be accepted. Also, there are studies that have compared uh, single blind reviews in which the author is known and the reviewer is anonymous, and double blind reviewers in which both author and reviewer are anonymous. It turns out that reviewers are more likely to recommend rejection of authors who are women, who are colleagues from a competing institution, or citizens of another country in single blind and in double blind reviews. So when they know the identity of the other, of the author, there's all kinds of biases against particular groups of people that are expressed in this situation, and I think anonymity uh, plays a role in this. There's also competition between age cohorts. I was once told by an NIH uh, grant officer that senior scientists sometimes kill their young. They're not so nice uh, to, to younger people. There's competition between different age groups. <laughs> And there's also some sort of tribal competition between groups of researchers that work with different uh, topics and different questions. So I'm a monkey researcher. I work with the, uh, uh, monkeys. When I apply for grants, I'm terrified that my grant application might be reviewed by people who work with rats because the rat people want to exterminate all the monkey people because they think that our animals are cooler than they are, and so they, they want to reject our application. So there is some of the stuff going on. The bottom line is that uh, the darkness, unfortunately, conditions of anonymity tend to favor competition because the reputation benefits of cooperation are low. If you behave yourself, you don't get credit because your identity is not known, but the cost of cheating are low, too, because you don't get caught. Okay, so uh, these are some issues you need to consider. Um, uh, let me say a little bit more about some of the issues that arise in uh, uh, cooperative relationships with business or romantic partners. So. Uh, Typically, when you establish a long-term uh, relationship in which there's some degree of cooperation, whether it's business or romantic, like marriage, at the beginning, typically, the benefits of the relationships are greater than the costs for both individuals. Otherwise, why would you start the, that relationship, right? Well, what happens with time is that circumstances often change, and this benefit-to-cost ratio might change for one of the two individuals. So that at some point, uh, the costs of being in that relationship become greater than the benefits. So that individual for, for whom this happens is tempted then either to uh, end the relationship or to start cheating. Okay, so economists describe this as the commitment problem. Okay, how do you keep a cooperative relationship together? Uh, and there's reasons to keep it together. For example, if it's a marriage, there might be children involved. If it's a company, there might be other employees that might suffer from, from the breakup and stuff like that. So how do you keep it together? How do you know that your partner is committed? How do you maintain this con commitment? in spite of these changes in benefit to cost ratios, because these, change, these changes will happen. And uh, uh, an American economist named Bob Frank, a few years ago, published a book called Passions Within Reason, in which he uh, advanced this theory about actually the evolution of romantic love. He argued that romantic love evolved to provide a solution to the commitment problem in romantic cooperative relationships. In other words, for two people to stay together, he argued, at some point, uh, rational decisions don't matter anymore because these benefit to cost ratio will change. So you need some irrational feeling, you need some irrational force that's going to make you stick to your partner in the relationship regardless of the losses that you have and whatever changes in these cost to be uh, benefit ratios. So here's this idea. So that's why we fall in love to make sure we maintain commitment in spite of uh, cost and benefits. Is this really true? Is this really true that uh, uh, this view of love explains uh, 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 our knowledge of this phenomenon in every situation. How about this? Let this view of love as a solution to the commitment problem explain uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, right? You know the story of this play. 
So Rano is in love with a woman uh, who does not reciprocate his love. In fact, she doesn't even know that, that he's in love with her. But he's in love with her for years. And uh, so obviously love here is not about maintaining commitment, it's not about maintaining the relationship because they don't even have a relationship, right? So uh, an important part of love is, is really is the longing for a relationship. You want to be with somebody and whether you're actually with this person or not, it doesn't really change the fact that you love this person. So I think that the economist theory does not apply <laughs> uh, to all uh, situations in which love occurs and there's other issues that I discuss in my book. So here's a different theory that I consider as to why love uh, has evolved. Why is it that people fall in love, which I think is pretty unique to the species, actually. There's no equivalent of romantic love in others. To understand the function of love, I think you have to think about the function of emotions. Okay, love is an emotion. And the function of emotions in general is to energize motivation, okay? So if you feel a strong positive or negative emotion, that's going to make you want to do something or make you want to avoid something a lot more than if this emotion was not present. Okay, so emotions energize motivation. And so one possibility is that love evolved essentially to motivate men and women to get together, to reproduce and stay together at least as long as it takes to, to raise one or more children to make sure that they, they survive. So uh, you're all familiar with this old movie, The Seven Year Itch. The title uh, comes from some uh, divorce data back in, in the 70s suggesting that most couples who divorce do so after seven years. Okay, most recent data suggests that it's actually four years. And there is interesting research done by anthropologists that suggests that uh, in non-industrialized uh, societies, uh, typically a woman has a child every four years. Okay, so people, uh, women breastfeed their children for four years. Uh, and so after four years, uh, uh, when the child is actually, uh, has a pretty good chance that he will survive or she will survive because the first couple of years are really risky in terms of infant survival, then that woman will move on and get a, and have another child or maybe split up. And, and uh, So the idea is that uh, uh, you need to, you know, it takes two parents to raise a rice, su su uh, child successfully. And so uh, would two people get together and stay together if love didn't exist? If, uh, if there was only sex, I think people would still have sex, but I don't think that they would spend much time together. <laughs> so uh, the best illustration of this principle that, that love is an energizer, I found this uh, monologue from one of my favorite uh, radio show hosts, uh, Joe Frank, he's based in Los Angeles, uh, has a radio show. This is taken from his Love Prisoner monologue. Uh, you can read it for yourself. It sort of uh, really speaks to this notion that, that when you fall in love, you know, it, it generates so much energy, you're willing to do all kinds of things, and that uh, motivates you to, to uh, establish and maintain this relationship. So what about the commitment problem? If, if love is not the solution to the commitment problem, how do we solve the commitment problem? Well, here's how baboons have come up with a solution to the commitment problems. In baboons, two males form a political alliance where they help each other in fights. So when one baboon gets into a fight with another, his ally will intervene and help him. So these alliances can be long-term, they're cooperative relationships, and every now and then the two baboons need to figure out whether the other male is still committed to the relationship, whether it can be trusted or not. So what they do to, tech, to check the commitment is they uh, get together and they fondle each other's genitalia. Okay, they briefly handle the other baboon's testicles. Okay, and it turns out that the word testify comes from the Latin word testis, which means testicle. Because in ancient Rome, two men who made a, a pledge of allegiance would hold each other's testicles. And a man would hold his own testicles while testifying in court, and that's where the word comes from. So why do the baboons do this, and why do the ancient Romans do this? Well, the idea is that uh, uh, if you're in a cooperative relationship, uh, uh, you need to test uh, uh, the strength of, of the other person's commitment. And there's weak ways and strong ways to do this. Uh, if you're in a romantic relationship, you can ask your partner, do you still love me? Are you sure you still want to be with me? And that can be a fine way uh, to test, but sometimes you know, people are not good with words and they say things they don't mean, or sometimes they don't even know what their real feelings are. So research in biology suggests that uh, a stronger test instead involves behaving in ways that are risky, that are dangerous, that are physically intrusive, essentially in ways that, that, that raise a cost to the other individual. And then you wait for a reaction. If the other individual is willing to pay that cost, is willing to be patient and tolerate your intrusion or your annoying behavior, that means uh, they're committed to the relationship. And you can have reason to, to, uh, to relax about the relationship. If they're intolerant, then, uh, uh, then it's bad news. So the idea here is that the best way to assess how much an individual values your relationship is to see what kind of price they're willing to pay. Okay, it's a basic principle from economics. Okay, so that's called the Handicap Principles. And the person who advanced this theory also argued that uh, 
it's not a coincidence, not an accident, that many expressions of love and affection in humans seem to have stress-inducing elements. If you think about it, why is it that lovers, uh, for example, uh, French kiss? Why, why, why French kissing? As opposed to, if you think about it, it's a pretty intrusive, invasive kind of thing. I mean, you would uh, agree to French kiss somebody only if you really love this person or you're committed to the relationship, right? <laughs> so, and there's other elements. Uh, he obviously has some ideas about sex, also being intrusive and stressful, and you might disagree with that. But, but the general idea is that uh, um, uh, uh, you impose a cost and see whether the other individual is willing uh, to pay this cost. So for the baboons, obviously, having somebody come and touch your testicles is very risky business. This person could, this baboon could put you out of business in five seconds if they have bad intentions. And the, and the baboon who does this oh, also is taking a big risk because you saw the, si the size of the canines of the baboons. He could get bitten in the head and be out of business. So there's risk taking on both sides and there has to be a lot of trust involved in this test of this relationship. Okay, so what biology and economics tell us is that uh, if you find yourself in a long-term cooperative relationship, you must do all these things. You must find out how your partner behaved in previous relationships, so gather information about previous behavior. You have to monitor his or her every move and play tit for tat, like the prisoner's dilemma. You have to provide incentives and rewards for cooperation, as well as discouragement and punishment for cheating. You have to use any means at your disposal, including feelings, morality, religion, and the legal system to make your partner behave. And finally, you have to check the strength of his or her commitment with bizarre, risky, annoying, or sexually daring behaviors on a daily basis. <laughs> but the bad news is that, despite all of these precautions, a cooperative relationship between two individuals might still go wrong. And the simple reason for that might be that you picked the wrong person to begin with, right? So how do you know if you picked the right person or the wrong person for you, well, typically the way people pick their partners occurs in the context of a market, okay? So we all operate in mating markets or marriage markets. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the market is that uh, uh, men and women have uh, different endowments that members of the other sex find uh, more or less uh, appealing or attractive. In the case of men, women tend to care about uh, a slightly older age, high physical attractiveness, wealth, power, high social celebrity status, and so on and so forth, whereas men, care about uh, 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 younger age in women, physical attractiveness, et cetera. There's all kinds of other things. In a market, there is the laws of supply and demand. There are few individuals that, that have uh, the endowments that make them appealing, and many others who don't. So there's people like Angelina Jolie and George Clooney who are in very high demand. Everybody wants people like that as their partners, but in very low supply. So the laws of the market are such that individuals in that situation can pretty much pick and choose any partner they want, and they seem to do that. So these are the partners that they chose, although I hear that George Clooney has already uh, moved on and changed his mind and uh, looking for a new partner already. <laughs> so uh, and there's other ways in which couples are matched for endowments. So this is an example of a couple where individuals might be matched in looks, personality, social status. Uh, that's another celebrity couple. I don't know how many of you know uh, Flavio Briatore, an Italian Formula One uh, businessman. The couple is matched because even though he's not as attractive, as his wife, uh, he's got a lot of money, celebrity status, and so there's good matching. So the idea is that uh, this matching occurs uh, in the market, whether, uh, uh, whether, pe whether or not people like it or they want it, it's the result of the, mar the market. The fact that individuals differ in these endowments, that there is competition for uh, people with high endowments, and that there is the laws of supply and, and demand. So matching, good matching is a good thing for you. It makes couple more stable. It makes it unlikely that the relationship is associated with different cost-benefit ratios for the two partners, and that might lead to one, uh, one partner to cheat or end the relationship. So how do you know where you stand in the mating market? What's your main value? Yes, people pretty much figure out uh, the value of their endowments with the experience, with feedback from other people, if you're doing adolescence, and usually end up uh, 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 pairing with an individual who has similar value. A human mating markets are by no means unique to, to, to our species. There's mating markets like this in birds, other mammals, primates, and they're not all about sex. There are markets about other things. For example, in fish, the, there is a, a large uh, species of large fish uh, that needs a smaller fish to swim inside their mouth and clean their mouths uh, from parasites and other things. These are called the client, the cleaner, and the client. So studies have shown that, that how uh, each fish chooses a partner for this thing uh, it's a complex operation that essentially involves a market. There are some uh, cleaners that have very high endowments, that have a good reputation, that do a good job, they don't cheat. There are uh, 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 
clients instead who are nice, others who end up swallowing the little fish instead, so they have a bad reputation. So the way these fish pick and choose one another, uh, it's really regulated by the laws of the market. So let me wrap this up now and, and tell you why is it that we see all these similarities between humans and other species in these games that we play. There's two processes that account for these similarities. One is called convergent evolution, the idea that organisms dealing with similar social problems come up with similar solutions independently. Uh, and I mentioned some of these uh, uh, situations, elevator effects, uh, market dynamics, cooperation, nepotism. The other phenomenon is called phylogenetic inheritance. The idea that two species that are closely related might be similar in their behavior because inherit this behavior from a common ancestor. So for example, chimpanzees and, and humans are closely related, uh, were very similar in some behaviors because we inherited these behaviors from an ancestor that we shared with chimpanzees about five to six million years ago. It's difficult to demonstrate uh, the inheritance of behavior like this, but they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So here's my contribution. This shows that even the most beautiful human smile has a long evolutionary history. That's a smile in a rhesus monkey and a chimpanzee, and that happens to be my wife. And thanks for your attention. <laughs> And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, try to answer them. Sorry. Yeah, I have one. Um, I have loads, actually. OK. But I'll try to stick to one. Um, I was interested in what you said about dominance and subordination. And your explanation for dominance was that it just makes life easier in general, faster, more efficient, things happen. And then I was thinking about how we're kind of brought up values that tell us that, well, you know, democracy is right and equality is right and you need to, like, take in everyone's views and then figure out what's best for everyone. So that kind of seems completely contrary to what you've just said is kind of the natural way or the biologically um, inherited way. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts well, are. Well, as I mentioned, I, I think dominance... Uh, uh, it's sort of an intrinsic aspect of every uh, uh, dyadic relationship between two people. It's almost inevitable that things can be exactly on, on a level of balance and equality. Uh, on a larger scale in a society, obviously, there's different degrees in terms of how power is, is handled. So there's despotic systems, which obviously dominance is right there in your face. So there's uh, despots who, who use and abuse their power. And it's just systems that are more egalitarian and democratic. But that doesn't mean that these, in these egalitarian democratic systems there's no dominance. Obviously, there's people with power uh, and people with less power. And having or not having power is associated with all kinds of benefits and perks and resources and things like that. So it's really an inevitable, uh, I mean, communism, right? Try to eliminate distinctions of power, and we see, uh, we know how well that, that worked. Uh, so, so, so I think it's better to understand that, that, that uh, the tendency to, uh, to be dominant is, is almost a universal aspect of animal behavior, including human behavior, which that doesn't make it necessarily a good thing. So it's not like, oh, it's good to be dominant. One thing that people can realize is that if you happen to be in a dominant position at work or at home, dominance comes with responsibility. So the fact that you have uh, uh, the potential to make decisions, it means that you need to, to do it uh, uh, nicely in a way that takes into account the needs and, and the rights of other people. So, so there is a sort of a gentle, uh, kinder uh, aspect to dominance, which is an opportunity. If you happen to dominate, I mean, well, you also have an opportunity to lead. And if you have the ability and the resources to lead, then there's nothing wrong with that, right? I'm kind of saying that despite our ideals, that we're kind of programmed to fall into those well, ask yourself. Usually, uh, well, I say, if I ask you to think about 100 different relationships that you have with people you know, starting with your family members, your friends, and stuff, and ask you to think whether you think uh, you're dominant or subordinate in each one of these relationships, my guess is that you can give me a good answer in at least 95% of the cases. I think if you think about it, in 95% of your relationship, you, can, you have a pretty good idea whether you're the one who calls the shots or not so much. There might be a 5% where things aren't clear. So does that mean dominance is universal? I think it's pretty pervasive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yes, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, right, can I just follow on from that? Um, it seems to me there's another big factor beyond um, dominance and cooperation uh, and negotiation, which also is quite low cost, which is just agreeing that you'll have certain customs and patterns. That's how my relationship works with my wife. There are lots of things that we need to do, which has a cost to each of us, whoever does it. 
but we've just agreed that one of us will do one generally and the other will do the other. That's great. There's divisional labor and there is, uh, uh, yes, ways to cooperate in a way that is complementary. But still, in every uh, long-term cooperative relationship, there is also always the potential for disagreements. Okay? No matter how good, how strong your relationship is, you end up disagreeing over a number of small issues, big issues on a daily basis. Uh, and it's not just in humans. Uh, it's, it happens that in many species of primates, uh, aggression and fighting is most common between closely related individuals. It's pairs of siblings, mothers and daughters, uh, uh, males and females who associate frequently, they fight with each other all the time, right? The most frequent crimes are committed in people, pairs of people who know each other well. So it's not that you go out and kill strangers, you go and kill your wife or your child, stuff like that. So your relationship could be, the point I'm trying to make is that it's not, I'm not trying to sell some pessimistic view of, of human nature, but is that it's, it's intrinsic to the notion that if you're in a long-term relationship with somebody, there are many opportunities for disagreeing about the way you do things. And uh, fighting all the time or negotiating all the time, every single time, it's just not productive, it's not cost effective, it's stressful, it's expensive energetically, it might damage your relationship, it, you know, uh, it's not nice to negotiate all the time, sometimes it's nice to, 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 uh, to make a decision and go on, and move on. <laughs> um, actually, it was similar to what you're saying, just thinking about like lots of different relationships, right? Mm -hmm. It strikes me as the dominance uh, interplay, it actually varies depending on what the topic happens to be that they're discussing. So it's not like, you know, you know, husband, wife, whatever, employer, employee, they're always, the, the dominant person is always the same person right. throughout. So, right. I, I mean, I didn't see much coming out. Its dominance is more complex than obviously uh, uh, the way I presented it. So dominance, first of all, is a characteristic of a relationship, not a characteristic of an individual, which means that you can be dominant in one relationship and subordinate in another. It depends on the relationship, not, not, not on you. But it's true also that there are individuals who tend to act dominant and to be dominant in many relationships and others instead who are dominant in very few relationships. In some cases, dominance is uh, independent of context, which means that if you're dominant in a relationship, you call the shots, you make decisions in every single context. In some cases, uh, uh, dominance is context dependent, which means that you make decisions about one domain and the other person makes the decisions in another domain. There's differences between species uh, and the extent to which this happens. In general, uh, if there is a large difference in dominance, so if you're really a lot higher in status than your partner is, uh, you tend to uh, make most of the decisions across contexts but it's sensitive to the environment, to the characteristic of the other individual. It's not a, a unitary complex. It can be complex to explain. And can we just take two more questions? Is that yes. okay? So there's one over there. So my question is, um, one thing you started out with in your, in your lecture or in your story mm -hmm. here is basically that pretty much everything humans do has a at least rudimentary version in the animal kingdom, correct? In some primate species, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so whatever. Species. Not everything. Not everything. Uh, but, but then you go on and you say, oh, but humans are special, and I don't get that. Why, okay. why are you suddenly <laughs> are you saying humans have a soul, something that is not? Okay. So uh, humans are special, and every animal species is special. Your domestic cat is special. They're not like dogs. Dogs are special. Chimpanzees are special. Uh, every species is special in its own way. Uh, humans are special uh, when compared to other primates especially because we have a very large brain. So our large brain essentially allows us to, to do things with our minds that other animals don't do, which is, for example, produce a abstract thought. We are unique in the animal world in our ability to think about things that don't exist in reality, that, that exist only at an abstract level. Also, we're unique in our ability uh, to think about religion, to think about God, to think about spirituality, to think about the future and plan, you know, years in advance to things that might happen, uh, to think about, uh, to produce art, for example. Uh, so in, in all these ways, and, and to produce cultures and laws and morality and, and things like that. I didn't say much about the stuff because that's not what my book is about. <laughs> my book is about social relationships. So the idea here is that uh, despite of these large brains and despite of this potential that we have to, uh, to think in abstract ways, to be moral, to be artistic, intellectual, when it comes to the day-to-day -day problems of social relationships, we end up using solutions that have been around a long time. 
that, that come to us almost instinctively, that our mind unconsciously uh, processes. And so these, some, these solutions are what we share with these other animals. So if I had written a book about morality or God or, or, or art, obviously, you know, I would have less of a reason to talk about uh, uh, primates. But I do talk in one of my chapters about, uh, because actually somebody yesterday, yesterday asked me this question, you know, what about a virtuous people like artists or, or religious leaders? Or uh, can you compare those to primates? You know, they've accomplished so much, you know. And, and the thing is that there's always an interesting disconnect between uh, what these people have accomplished in, in their intellectual life, in their public life, and, and, and what they do in their personal lives. Sometimes, you know, talk about Pablo Picasso and the issues he had in his private life. Uh, you know, sometimes you read about the personal lives of these people who are very virtuous in public, but they have a history of marriage and divorce, of extramarital affairs, of greed for money, and things like that. So when it comes to your relationships and, and social lives, I think people are more, much more similar to each other than they are different because we share this, this background. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so when, when you uh, gave a comparison of uh, communication uh, with another person over email or like in life, um, then w one thing came to my mind that with internet and with like email and instant messaging, you can actually allow yourself to have conversation with like several different people and this conversation will be isolated from each other. Mm -hmm. So does it somehow like change something in the patterns? Or are there like new patterns appearing? I'm sure there are. Yes, I'm sure there is all kinds of new things that that originate with the uh, the ability to uh, interact simultaneously with, with multiple people. So, but uh, as there are benefits, there's probably also costs. So there's something that you lose, you know, if you don't have that uh, uh, direct face-to-face -face interactions. You know, when when we when we speak in person, we we use facial expressions, we use hand gestures to tell the other person, look. Uh, uh, what I'm saying right now, I mean it very seriously or just for fun. You know, you can say, I really, you know, you, sometimes you make me want to kill you. You know, but if I say it with a smile on my face, you know, I'm joking. If I say it on email, you don't know what to interpret that. You have to use a little emoticon with a little smiley face to say I'm joking. You know, but uh, do emoticons really do it all? Uh, do they really uh, 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 replace uh, all the facial expressions, all the, uh, all the other gestures that we use to supplement the information that we provide with our words. In my view, they don't. And also, there's all kinds of other dynamics that come into play, you know, including relative status, cost and benefits, what you expect from the relationship. That all uh, plays a role in our communication dynamics, no matter how high-tech they are. Um, so I'm afraid that we've run out of time. Um, but I just want to say thanks again for coming in and talking to us Thanks today. for having me. Really thanks for having me. Talk. And if we could just give them another round of applause. So thank you.